for the church, the body of Christ. And that next event, according to my understanding, is the rapture, which means that all believers, dead or living, will be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. But that doesn't stop things going on down here on earth. God's, I believe God starts His program or restarts it with the nation of Israel. And things will revert back, as far as the Jews are concerned, to the way they were in the book of Acts. And God will have a remnant of Jews or a group of, a handful of Jews that will start preaching the gospel of the kingdom. The same gospel that was preached in Matthew and Mark and Luke and John and in the early part of the book of Acts. The miracles will also be present. And those are kingdom miracles and those things will be present and those Jews will start preaching to their own people first, just like they did in the book of Acts. And they will work at getting their own nation to repent. And there will be severe persecution before the Lord returns. And of course the Lord has to really judge the nation before they will repent. He judged them in 70 A.D and almost destroyed them and they still did not repent as a nation but they will repent the next time that's for sure in the fourth sowing there will be a harvest and uh, <clears throat> they will repent and then they will start moving out to the rest of the Gentile world they'll go to the surrounding nations then they'll go to the rest of the world preaching the gospel of the kingdom and that'll take place not only in the tribulation period, but in the early part of the millennium. And uh, the kingdom will be set up, an earthly kingdom will be set up at Jerusalem, where Christ will rule and reign. The twelve disciples will be resurrected, and uh, they will rule and reign with Him over Israel, over the twelve tribes. And then, of course, there will be others who will be ambassadors to other parts of the world and uh, the kingdom will go out and the government will be set up. The devil will be put in the bottomless pit for a thousand years. Christ will rule as a dictator with a rod of iron and righteousness will cover the, that is righteousness, that doesn't mean every person will be righteous, but a righteous government will be in place justice will be meted out people that are dishonest uh, will be removed I don't know what to what degree but there will be a righteous government and um, and and Christ and his followers his kingdom leaders will ensure that it takes place the church doesn't have any part in bringing about that kingdom. We are not kingdom builders. And so lest anybody think that the body of Christ has some kind of an agenda to convert the world, uh, that just isn't true. The Bible teaches right the opposite. And uh, <clears throat> the church will never convert the world. If anything, the world will convert the church. And that is what Paul said. He makes it very clear that the apostasy will take place in these last days. And I think it's already here. I think it's been here for years. That doesn't mean every church has to go into apostasy, and it doesn't mean every believer has to be an apostate. That doesn't mean that, but by, by and large, that is the spirit and the condition of today. We're living in a day when folks question the Bible. I'm, talk, I'm talking about Christians. I'm not talking about lost people now. I'm not, or maybe they're lost, but I'm not talking about non-religious people. It's the religious people who question the Bible who defend sodomy, who promote abortion. I'm talking about people who say they're Christians. I'm talking about people who say they believe the Bible and believe in God and believe in Jesus Christ and go into heaven. Really. So we're living in queer days. 
or strange days. Just a slip there. So the church is not going to convert the world, but we ought to be about trying to get everybody saved we can. We, you know, you can never stop trying to get people saved. Because even in the apostasy and even in the tribulation period, multitudes will be saved. So I don't, you know, you get, get over this negativism that we're living in a day when people cannot be saved. In fact, I think it's easier to get folks saved today than it's ever been. I really do. I think Christians have far more to deal with, but I think what's happening is people are being forced more and more, being polarized, polarized, how do you say it? Yeah, from one side to the other where you have to make a decision. And I think a lot of young people who are not even saved want some values and they want to find something, especially if they've got a family. They get some kids, they're looking for something that's solid. So these are wonderful days to live in as far as serving Jesus Christ. Uh, churches are growing by leaps and bounds, and uh, many people are preaching the gospel, and folks are getting saved. Thank God for it. Uh, but Christians just have more influence today that they have to war against uh, in order to live for God. And so I'm not saying it's easier to live for God. I said it was easier for folks to get saved, and I believe that. But it's also very difficult to, to, to live for the Lord because of all of the, the media influence that we have uh, for wrong, no matter where you go. You walk to the mall, you come out, you need a bath. Right. You go to a movie theater, you're corrupted within the first 15 minutes. I mean, we don't, we don't even have, we don't have cable at our house. We, we, get, we, get five, we get three channels of pictures and two of snow. And, and, you know, and we were watching, you know, just trying to watch something the other night as a family. And, and you go from channel to channel, and there's just sexual implication in everything. Just everything. And the only people going to bed together with each other are the unmarried couples. I mean, you stop and think about it. It's just, you know. And uh, so consequently, you've got that. Then you've got the Internet. If you... You know, if you don't have a guard on that thing, you're going to have pornography in your house and in your mind and in your heart. So you need to either blow that thing up or get a, get a grip on your life. See? So there's just too many things. Everything is out there right in your face, and uh, it's not going to get better. So, you're, you know, Christians are going to have to, you know, it's going to have to get in the book. That's all I know to tell you. I don't know, I don't know, I don't have another answer. I don't know what it is, you know. I mean, the Lord saved us, but He didn't take us out of the world. We, we're not supposed to go to, you know, uh, uh, to a mountain somewhere and get sheets and weight, you know, I mean, ascension robes. And uh, so, uh, so we're, uh, <coughs> we're here. And, uh, but one of these days, I believe the trumpet is going to sound and the dead in Christ are going to be raised. But that's not the end of the program by any means. In fact, there is no end of the program. Uh, but everything in the Bible is not about you or about me. Everything in the Bible is not about the church. Most of it is not about us or the church. The church is that mystery that's in the parentheses that you and I are now a part of. But one of these days we're out of here and the, the millennial kingdom will, will kick in sometime to follow that. And uh, the kingdom that John the Baptist was preaching about and the disciples and, and all of those uh, miracles and all of that that was taking place will be done at the beginning of the millennial, at the beginning in the tribulation to verify the message that uh, will be preached. Now that kingdom, we call it the millennium because it means a, it lasts a thousand years. It lasts one thousand years and at the end of the thousand years we read that the devil is going to be released out of it, out of the pit and he will go around the world and he will deceive the nations. Now keep in mind, I said there would be a righteous government. But that doesn't mean every citizen in that government is righteous. That's not what it means. You've got a dictatorship and within a few hundred years or a thousand, you know, maybe, I don't know how long down the road, but there's going to be people born just like your little babies. They're going to be born 
just like you. This is not heaven we're talking about. It's just a kingdom where Christ rules. And there will be so many major changes, but, but man's nature will not be changed. And so uh, <clears throat> children will be born, people will grow up, and they will, because we all have sinful hearts, these, these new citizens will hate this, this dictatorial government. And uh, the only uh, the reason they don't really rebel against it outwardly is they can't get a foothold. They can't find leadership. They can't, but if they could have a leader, they're ready to go. But there's no leader. So at the end of this thousand years, the Lord lets the, lets the devil out of the bottomless pit for the purpose of going forth and deceiving these kings throughout the Gentile world. Now, not all of them, but many of them rise up in rebellion. And they're rebelling against the headquarters at Jerusalem and against the king. And their purpose is to go and to remove this dictatorship and, and, and get a democracy going again. And they're going to have democracy if they have to kill you. So what they do is they go up, and, uh, up to Jerusalem <coughs> and uh, for that purpose, and the Bible says that God calls fire down out of heaven and burns up those armies. Now, what follows that? Well, I believe the thing that, uh, that is associated with that is uh, when Peter says that, that uh, there will be a new heaven and a new earth, and he says that the first heaven and earth is burned up, and, uh, and, there, and so God establishes a new heaven and a new earth. Now, is it this planet? I think so. I think it will be this planet. I have reasons, and I know why folks teach that. It doesn't have to be this planet, but it, it probably is. If it is this planet, changes will have to take place on it, similar to what took place uh, between the original creation and the six-day creation in Genesis 1 and 2. Because he tells us in Revelation chapter 21, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. So evidently in this new earth that is going to be established, there will not be any oceans or seas. doesn't mean there won't be any water, but it will be absent, and uh, you will probably have almost 100% land mass, where today you have, you know, most of the earth is covered with water and it's water you can't drink, salt water. But um, so uh, it appears then that this, you can see the change that would have to absolutely take place. Uh, the earth may be a plain, maybe there probably won't be any need for mountains. Because I, obviously it'll probably take us back to something like Adam and Eve had in the garden, in the Garden of Eden. <clears throat> okay. So uh, John said, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, come down from God out of heaven. So then here is a city that God himself builds. And uh, on this new earth now, there is a new Jerusalem coming down to be on this earth. Um, some say that this city existed in the millennium. Uh, maybe it did. I don't know. There are those that teach that it was suspended above the earth during the millennium, during the thousand years, and then after that it comes down to the earth. But, um, you know, that's really neither here nor there on that. But you'll notice that this city is beautiful. It is verse 2. It says, it is as a bride adorned for her husband. So, you know, a bride, uh, she dresses in pure white. She puts on her best jewels. And uh, is as actually for her, it's, 
the attempt to be the most beautiful day of her life. And so what he's saying here is this city is as beautiful as I can describe it. I mean, it's, it's pure, and it is, uh, it is adorned, and you'll see later how it is adorned. And then John said, And I heard a, I heard a voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And you might want to notice that word tabernacle because it means to dwell. That is, God's dwelling place is with men. And God, as I've said, is a God of fellowship. God has always desired to fellowship with His creatures. For God so loved the world. And that's why God desires your prayer, your fellowship, to, for you to spend time with Him because He is a God who loves fellowship. He loves it more than, you know, you think about it, he loves fellowship more than you and I do. And uh, he walked with Adam in the garden because it was obviously they spent time together. He walked with Enoch. Enoch walked with God. And then uh, when uh, the nation of Israel was established, there was a tabernacle right in the middle, middle of the nation, or of the camp. And God came and, and, uh, and symbolically dwelt among them. And then today, God dwells in His people. He's in you. And uh, you remember the booths that they made, the, the Feast of Tabernacles? Uh, it has to do with rest, but God always wants to dwell with His people. And uh, you need to think not of God as somebody that's afar off. If you're saved, He's in you. He's in you. And you are in Him. But the time is going to come, uh, according to this text, that God will tabernacle with man. And notice it says He d will dwell. That is, He'll live among them. That's interesting. He will dwell among them. And that is, so, that is in this city, and uh, they will be His people, and God Himself shall be with them and be their God. In verse 4, it says that He will wipe away all tears. Now, the, the, uh, it's not implying that people are going to be there crying and weeping. That's not what it's saying. You know, folks will say, well, people have to be crying if God wipes them away. That's a little stretch of the imagination. I think the idea is that just the very fact that, that we are with God, the tears will all be, they'll disappear. See? And I know, it's, you know, I know it's good preaching. We talk about taking a little kid on our knees and taking our handkerchief and wiping their tears, and that's very literal. And so there are those who say, oh, that's God goes to every person and individually wipes all their tears. It's not that He can't do that, but I just don't think that's what it's teaching. The idea here is that the former things are passed away. And that means tears have passed away. See? And, uh, and, and crying has passed away. And death has passed away. Verse 4. And sorrow has passed away. And pain has passed away. The former things are passed away on this new heaven and this new earth. Can you imagine that being absolutely pain free? You know, and you don't have to take any drugs. You're just pain free. <clears throat> all right. Now he he that sat upon the throne said, "Behold, I make all things new." And the one that sits on the throne here is Jesus Christ. And he is making all things through. And he said, "Right, because these words are true." So John wrote the book of Revelation. And uh, and he wrote the entire book. Now. In verse 6, he said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, that is, God is the beginning and the end, and He's everything in the middle, which means God is everything. There was nothing before God, there will be nothing after God, because there is no before God and there is no after God. There's no such thing. He said, I am the Alpha and the, the Omega, the beginning and the end, and I will give to him that is a thirst the fountain of the water of life freely. Now, 
In verse 6, when he said, I will give to him that is a thirst, that doesn't mean that it's talking about people who are thirsty in the new heaven and the new earth because nobody will be thirsty. He's talking in the context of the millennial kingdom and the tribulation, those that are a thirst. He's not talking about He's not talking about the context of those that will be in the new heaven and the new earth and be thirsty, because that's not going to happen. He's also talking about the tribulation uh, period in verse 7 and 8, because he said, He that overcometh shall inherit all things. Now, what does he have to overcome? Well, you don't have to overcome anything. You are an overcomer because Jesus Christ has overcome everything for you. Now, you don't have to overcome to go to heaven. If you did, you could never know for sure you were saved because you would never know. And then what do you have to overcome? This is very specific what they have to overcome. They have to overcome the mark of the beast. That's what they have to overcome. And why would a person uh, not overcome and take the mark of the beast. Well, the next verse tells you because of fear. It is the fearful. Now, that doesn't mean if you're afraid of flying. That doesn't mean if you have claustrophobia. That's not talking about fears that you have in this life. It's talking about the fear to stand up against the Antichrist and the mark of the beast unto death. And that's what the book of Revelation and Hebrews is about. It's about overcoming. It's about the overcomers. It comes up repeatedly. But the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have uh, their part in the lake of fire that burns with fire and brimstone. Now you've got a problem because everybody has lied, right? So once again, I think the lying here is the embracing of the lie. I think it's a lie, the specific lie. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ, right, John says. So it is denying that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, just as the Jews did when he first came. That's the lie that it's talking about. That's the fear, the, the mark of the beast, because the context is the tribulation, he that overcometh. And also, uh, you read about the sorcery. Uh, they'll have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And I don't have time to talk about the fire and the brimstone and the, or the second death. That's not my point tonight. Now he said in verse 9, he said, come here, uh, come, and one of the seven angels said, uh, come, and uh, I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. Now, the bride here in this text is not the body of Christ, the church. Now, we have heard over and 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 over that the body of Christ is the bride of Christ. Now, I know it is likened to a bride. I'm aware of that in the book of Ephesians. I'm aware of that. And uh, it's likened to a building. These are metaphors. It's likened to a building. It's likened to a bride. And uh, I'm very much aware of that. But the body of Christ is not in the picture here in the book of Revelation. See, uh, the bride here is the nation of Israel. See, and all you do is you read through the Old Testament repeatedly about Israel being Jehovah's wife and how God is married to them, and yet he said in Hosea, I have put you away, but he said, I'm going to marry you again. See? And uh, he carried me away into a mountain. The, the, the wife is, by the way, is the city. It's not the church unless you make the city the church. I mean, you can do that, but the wife here is the church. Notice what it says in verse 10, And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, 
and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God, and uh, having the glory of God, and her light was likened to a stone most precious, even likened to a jasper stone clear as crystal. So this city now, he says that the, uh, the lamb's uh, wife, if you notice in verse 9, the bride, the lamb's wife, was arrayed like a, um, uh, a bride for her wedding. Now he goes and describes the city, which is the bride, the lamb's wife. However, a city must have people in it or it's a ghost town. Uh, Seattle implies the citizens within that city. Or you don't have a city technically, you just have buildings. And so he talked about, uh, in verse 12, and it had a great wall, high. Now notice how many times you see this word 12 coming up. Notice first of all that it had 12 gates and at the twelve gates, uh, at the twelve gates, twelve angels, uh, and, and, and at the gates, twelve angels, and the names thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of Israel. That ought to give, be a giveaway right there, shouldn't it? Because at the gates you have the twelve tribes of Israel. That's, that's kind of interesting. At the gates of this city are the names of the twelve tribes of Israel. I wonder if the 12 tribes, I wonder if it's part of the 12 tribes, some portion of the 12 tribes that live in the city. And they have their gate that they enter. They're there for some reason. Not only that, but uh, in verse 13, on the east, uh, three gates, and he lists on each side. And then if you go to 14, it says, And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in them the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. Once again, not the apostles of the church, but these are the twelve apostles. So the gates are the twelve tribes of Israel, and the foundations are the twelve apostles. And, of course, he measured the city, in verse 15 and 16, and the city, of course, is four square. It's a cube, but it's a cube like a pyramid. And uh, it is 1,500 miles high and 1,500 miles square, or 1,500 miles wide. That's a pretty good sized town. 1,500 miles would put you about where from the west coast here? How far would that be? San Diego? How far is Salt Lake City? About that? I don't know. Put you over in the Minnesota. That's pretty good size. Uh, what street do you live on? Uh, John 316. <laughs> Where is that? Over by Missoula? <laughs> Just a drive. 1,500 miles. However, the earth is 8,000. You know, folks say, how could you have a city out there spinning around that's, uh, you know, going around that's 1,500 miles uh, in diameter? Well, you live on a piece of real estate that's 8,000 miles high and 24,000 miles around the center. And it's just floating around out here. I mean, what do you think? It's on a turtle's back? It's just floating around out here. So I don't know why a 1,500-mile city would be any problem, do you? Christians just all of a sudden become unbelievers. So it's no problem. Not a problem at all if you believe in God. When you believe in God, it just takes care of every problem. <laughs> just removes all the obstacles, but it's not a problem. So this city, and this city, of course, uh, uh, has, and you notice I'm not going to read all of the various uh, gems that are listed here, but it starts in about verse 18, and look at those stones as you get all the way down to verse 21, 
And uh, notice the 12 gates were 12 pearls. And, uh, and the street of the city were pure gold, as it were transparent glass. See, that's just beyond comprehension. What people fight and kill for down here, you're going to walk on, they're going to pave their streets with up there. You see the paving crew, somebody, what's that, what's that stink? That's just gold, that paving crew's out there again, you know. <laughs> uh, I kind of like being around those trucks, you know. When I go by where they're doing that hot tar on a roof, I just stop. I like it. My wife doesn't like it, but I, I kind of like it stuff. But, but some people are weird. I'm not going to say who. But now it goes back to the temple, verse 22, and I saw no temple therein. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. So this city doesn't need a temple. It actually is the tabernacle, the whole city itself. So it doesn't have a temple, doesn't need one. The temple, it, the city is the temple or the tabernacle in which God is, is, is dwelling there with His people. And, uh, and the city had no need of the sun. Doesn't mean there isn't a sun or the moon. Doesn't mean they don't still exist. But uh, it says it doesn't have any need of it. And the reason for that is because the Lord Himself is the light in that city. Now it's possible the city itself gives light to the earth. I mean, you can go, as, go anywhere you want with all this. But maybe like a diamond out there in outer space, and it just sends the light down? I don't know. But now you run into something here. Verse 24. And the nations of them which are saved. Now you got nations which are saved shall walk in the light of it. So now then we've got this city we've been talking about that possibly is suspended in outer space. Maybe it, well, in outer space. And then you've got this new earth with no ocean on it. I think like the Garden of Eden, because I think that's where we're going back to here on this. It's taking you back to the Garden of Eden. And uh, there was no need of an ocean. Uh, they had rivers, and they had, uh, the earth was watered with a mist, if you remember. It had never rained. There's no need for it. But it wasn't heaven. And we're not talking about heaven here. We're talking about the new earth and the new Jerusalem. These are in heaven, but you're in heaven right now. You're in the heavens. The earth is spinning in the heavens. And so the new earth will be in the new heavens, and the new Jerusalem will be there. And uh, so you have nations upon this new earth. And uh, maybe these are Jewish nations. There are 12 nations. Some people think they're Gentiles. Um, notice it says in verse 25, The gates of the city shall not be shut by day, nor, and there shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. So then evidently, life, eternal life, goes on on the earth where there is no sea, and there's no sickness, and there's no sin, and there's no death. And uh, there will be farming. See, folks get this idea that this is heaven. This is not heaven we're talking about. It's the new earth. If we're talking about heaven, we're talking about something that is uh, intangible, something that is spiritual. But this is literal. This is an earth just like the one you walk on. You know, sometimes folks get the idea that, that all of this is completely sanitary. In other words, everything is of white uh, formica, you know, or plastic. And just everybody's white and everything's white, you know. And uh, nobody spits, you know. You, you, know, you know what I mean? We just got to get this thing that it, it's just all sanitary. And um, heaven may be that way. I, I don't think it will, but 
we're not talking about heaven here. We're talking about the new earth. And the new earth will probably be like the Garden of Eden, something similar to that. And uh, notice that uh, the nations in verse 26 will bring their glory and honor uh, they will bring to this new Jerusalem. Uh, they will bring their honor and their glory. And this may refer to a tithe or an offering as well as their worship because those will go together. In verse 27, people are assured that there will in no wise enter anything that defileth that is, into this city, or whatsoever worketh abomination, or maketh a lie, but they that are written in the Lamb's book of life. So these things are not going to be there. They're not going to be able to enter in because they will not be present. So once again, people who, who are of this character in the tribulation and the millennium will not go into the new heaven and the new earth. Now the question may come up is, is okay, we've got all these people in the millennium millions of them, and uh, maybe millions of them have followed the Lord Jesus Christ as, as the king in the millennium. I'm sure the devil has been released at the end. He goes forth and he deceives, and they go up against Jerusalem. God calls fire down and destroys them. But if God destroys the heaven and the earth, or when he destroys the heavens, the, the heavens and the earth, where do these people take refuge? That is, the redeemed. What happens? Um, well, there, first of all, there may be a new heaven and a new earth. And God transports these people just as people are raptured. He takes them and puts them on the new heaven and the new earth. He doesn't have to do it that way. If you remember the three Hebrew children were in the fiery furnace and the fire was heated seven times hotter, and yet, when it was all over with, there was no even smell of smoke on their clothing. So I'm telling you that to tell you this, God can make people fireproof. Okay? Um, a third option, which I don't know that it would hold up, but it is possible that people could be in the New Jerusalem if that new Jerusalem is in the millennial kingdom, which I, I doubt that it is. So, uh, first of all, I'm not dogmatic about any way how God does it, okay? But I know God does do it. He has to do it. But as to how he's going to do it, I would not be dogmatic. But there might be a new earth, and God would place people on it, burn this one up, or he could burn this one up, and folks on it wouldn't even, wouldn't even uh, feel anything. So I honestly don't know the answer to that. If you find the answer, you can let me know. Send email. Just send it to K Blue. I'll get it. Oh, you need to put a few more things. Like Billy Graham. I always was impressed. Just send your mail. Billy Graham, Minneapolis, Minnesota. You know. All right. Now. <clears throat> okay all right now when you get to chapter 22 and I'm going to try to wrap this up uh, in chapter 22 it says and he showed me a pure river of the water of life clear as crystal proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb well this is called the water of life and um uh, in the midst of the street within this city and on either side of the river, notice there's the tree of life. Now either there's one tree that is overshadowing both sides, however I think Larkin and many others, they have rows of trees on both sides of the river. Uh, even though it doesn't say trees of life, it says tree of life, so uh, you know you can have it, have it your way. Uh, notice it says it bare twelve manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month. So the months still continue, the calendar's still in place. 
And every month there's a different kind of fruit on this tree or these trees. And it's called the tree of life. So you know you're back to the garden, you've got a river, you've got a tree, and uh, it's interesting when Adam and Eve were in the garden, they were in a perfect environment, and there was no death, but they had at their disposal, they had the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they also had the trees, there was all kinds of fruit and food to eat, you may eat of every tree of the garden except this one, the, knowledge, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and there was the tree of life. So there was a tree of life, tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which they were not to eat, and then all kinds of trees of which they could eat. Now evidently they never ate of the tree of life, or at least they were not permitted to eat of that tree after the fall. In fact, God had to protect it because He said, lest they eat of it, that's after they've fallen, and eat of it and live forever. So God put up a, a, a sword and an angelic creature to guard the tree of life, lest He eat of it, that's what you read in Genesis, and live forever. Now I don't know if one eating of that tree would bring about eternal life or if the tree was left available, man would go and eat of it even in his sinful condition and it would maintain his physical life. But it's there and they were told they were forbidden to eat of it and it had to be guarded lest they eat of it. So the answer to the question, uh, would one eating of that tree have brought about eternal life for Adam and Eve in their sinful state. I personally doubt it based on what we're reading in Revelation because it looks like it's a monthly thing. Does that make sense? Now why will people eat of that tree of life? And why will they need to if they need to? Well I think one of the things is that we fail to take into consideration is that there will be people on the new earth once again in their natural bodies. Not everybody on the new earth will be in a glorified body. They will be in natural bodies. But the curse will be removed and they will be like Adam and Eve were before the fall. Does that make sense? And Adam and Eve were told to multiply and replenish the earth long before they ever fell into sin. So think about it now. If Adam and Eve had not disobeyed God and, and taken of the tree, and if they would have obeyed God and ate of the tree of life and replenish the earth, could you imagine how many children they could have? You think about it. Could you imagine that you live to be a hundred years old or a thousand years old and you could have children up until you were <laughs> seven or eight hundred years of age? That's a wonderful thought, isn't it, ladies? That's a lot of morning sickness. But, and, and you know, I may be so far out here in left field, I can't see home plate. But nevertheless, these are some things to think about because when Adam and Eve were in the garden, they were allowed to eat of any tree of the garden except the one. After they fell, a God had to put an angel to guard the tree of life, and it says, lest he eat of it and live forever. So here's my thinking on this, that Adam and Eve, when they were in their innocent state or state of innocence, were required to eat of the tree of life on a regular basis. Ooh, I hate to say this, because you're going to cry heretic. To eat of this tree of life in order to sustain or maintain their physical life. Okay? 
Now, maybe that's not true. But if it's not true, you tell me why the tree was put there. And you tell me why God blocked the tree after they fell. I don't know why, okay? But at least I'm going to give you something to think about, and I want you to think about it. I'm not saying I'm right, but I am. No, I just, you know, no, I don't, I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't want to be arrogant about this, but, but this is, you know, when I try to think it through, this is what I come up with. So therefore, when you come to the end of the book, you're back into a paradise and you've got a tree of life and some people are at least are allowed to come and eat of the tree because it's there and notice something about it you know you have nations and look at verse 12 or verse 2 of 22 2 in the midst of the street of it and the river there's a tree of life every month and the leaves of the trees were for the healing of the nations or for the health of the nations the healing now remember, there's no more sickness, there's no more pain, there's no more death. So these nations are for their, I think, for their sustained health, whatever that implies. All right, verse 3, there's no more curse, as it was when God cursed the ground. Remember, cursed is the ground for your sake, thorns and thistles will it bring forth. The curse has been removed. I mean, fellow tries to grow a garden, what does he do? Winds up with nothing but weeds, you know. But the curse is removed. See? Landscapers are out of business. You cut the grass once, and it's that way forever. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You plant a roadie, it's just there. You see? Okay. I don't know. Sounds good. All right, verse 3, And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and His servants will serve Him. And they shall see His face, and their name shall be in their foreheads. That's an interesting, because the mark of the beast is in the forehead of those who follow the beast. See? So once again, we're back to this overcoming thing and, and implication. Verse 5, And there shall be no night there, no need of a candle, neither the light of the sun, the Lord and it really this is just a parallel to some degree of the preceding chapter just like chapter 2 is a parallel of chapter 1 in the book of Genesis these chapters are parallel and they just have they're not they're not different information they're additional information okay he said verse 6 these sayings saying are true and uh, the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servant the things which shall shortly be done. Which shall shortly be done. Now John is writing that, uh, kind of a postscript here. And uh, then in verse 7 says, Behold, I come quickly. Well, when the book of Revelation, the events of the book of Revelation, when they kick in, these events are coming rather fast. Okay? And, uh, and, and so the thousand-year millennial kingdom begins. And keep in mind, the kingdom doesn't go out there and then stop and then a new program. The kingdom really goes on forever. It's just there's just some changes made in it uh, at, the, at that end of that thousand-year period. But it doesn't go out and the kingdom end. The kingdom goes on forever. Now, in the book of Isaiah, I think it is, it says, listen carefully, and of the increase of his kingdom, there shall what? There shall be no end. And of the increase of his kingdom, there shall be no end. Adam and Eve were told before they fell to multiply and replenish the earth. And I started to tell this earlier and got sidetracked in my somewhere, but listen carefully. If Adam and Eve had obeyed God, there would be people on this earth right now, 15 miles high, stacked, 15 miles high per square foot. Do you realize if they'd, have dis if they'd have obeyed God, there'd be no death? If they would have obeyed God, there'd be no war. 
if they would have obeyed God, there'd be no sin or sickness, right? And therefore, no death, no war, no sin, no sickness. People live forever and have children and children and children. This earth couldn't possibly contain them. Now then, you've got, to, you've got something you've got to deal with. Either God programmed man and, can, and, and planned for man to sin and keep killing each other off to keep the population down, or he planned for, man, for his kingdom to keep on expanding. You can't have it both ways. Now the Mormons have picked up on this thing. And of course, they, they, they are wrong on their doctrine of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of polytheism, and multiple gods, and, and, uh, and multiple wives, and all of that kind of nonsense. But they are not wrong in their teaching of the increase of the kingdom. So what happens then is there will be people who will go into the new earth and uh, possibly Jews, maybe all Jews, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Some people think the earth will be given to the Jews. But never, that doesn't matter to me. But there will be people that will go into that in their natural bodies without fallen natures. God will change them. And so therefore, it will be like it was in the Garden of Eden people multiplying and replenishing the earth and then <clears throat> what happens when the earth is filled up it's going to have to go somewhere else and really that's what man is trying to do right now isn't it that's man's dream right now is to colonize other planets even in his fallen nature that's what he believes that's what he's that's what he's about it's what he wants to do. It's what he believes. In fact, all scientists are confident it will happen, aren't they? Well, if they can do it through science, do you think God would have any trouble doing it? Okay. Now, I know we're out in deep water. <laughs> I know we're a long ways from the Baptist shore. <laughs> you know, I'm aware of that. And I know some of you, you thought John 3.16 was the only verse in the Bible. See. But you need to think a little bit about at least things are going somewhere. Amen. Now, I haven't even mentioned where the church is going to be. I haven't even mentioned the church tonight, have I? And I don't think I will because of time. And maybe, maybe next Thursday night or the following one, we'll talk a little about where's the church going to be. Because that's what you're concerned about. Where am I going to be? Well, I have a skateboard on one of those gold streets or, you know, or whatever, you know. Where's my mansion, you know, all that kind of stuff. Okay? All right. Well, that's a start for you. Hey, search it out. Read it yourself. you, you got a Bible. Read those chapters and see what you come up with. I'd be, I'd be interested in hearing what you, what you come up with and, you know, you can share some things with me on it and, uh, you know, God may just give you a vision. Who knows? Maybe you'll have a have a vision. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> All right, let's stand together. We'll be dismissed in prayer. Uh, Brother Joel, go ahead and dismiss us in prayer, please.